The Kudu's relying only on hearing now. Sociable weavers are getting ready to breed. The caracal's fine-tuned senses are fired up. While humans only have six ear muscles, each caracal ear is controlled by 20 separate muscles, which move and tilt the ears independently. Three main groups of muscles work separately. The superior raises the ear. The posterior moves the ear outwards and back. And the cervico lowers the ear downwards. Large feline satellite dishes capture sound waves and direct them into the ear canal. No footfall goes unheard. Its ear canals are proportionally longer than those of humans and dogs and are far more sensitive to sound. She has to rely on camouflage and cover to get as close as possible. And a silent ambush is key. The caracal's feet are designed for a surprise attack. The fur between her foot pads consists of stiff hairs providing a cushioned and silent stalk. This allows her to get within a few feet of prey before triggering the alarm. She's off. The caracal's powerful hind legs and fine-tuned reflexes make her agile. The weaver's fast, but she's locked her sights on it. Powerful slap has injured the weaver. But meals don't come that easy in the desert. In this game of cat and bird, there can only be one winner. It's over in seconds. A few lucky weavers have escaped her grasp for now. Thanks to her streamlined speed and agility, she can finally enjoy a meal. Nikita's just feet away from a possible barn owl breakfast. She's got to take her hunt 30 feet vertical. If she can get to the first fork of the tree quickly, She'll catch them before they flee. Timing and speed are key here. They're huddled inside. Nikita gets to work tearing down the door. One owl flies the coop. Nikita's strategy unfolded perfectly. Great innovation in action, even if it's little more than a mouthful of feathers. Leopards remove all the feathers from birds before eating them. So once the chick has been plucked, it only qualifies as an appetizer. A new 
threat has arrived on the riverbank. They're a roving pride of lions, undernourished and looking for territory. It's the dry season, a daily battle for survival. And like the hippos, they rely on both land and water. Twelve lions of various ages. It's a lot of mouths to feed. To satisfy twelve bellies efficiently, they need to set their sights on big prey. They're hungry and thirsty. Temperatures are soaring over a hundred degrees and they can smell water. To get a drink, they need to breach the riverbank. But this is hippo country, and they must respect the bull's territory. Hippos are fiercely territorial and notoriously aggressive when defending their patch. Even lions give them a wide berth. But the pride male bows to no one. lion is no match for an enraged hippo ten times his weight. The water line marks the boundary, and to cross it, he'd better be primed for battle. At two months old, they have yet to learn how dangerous their world is. Hyenas and leopards are notorious cub killers. Less than half of lion cubs get to see their first birthday. And even fewer make it to adulthood. But the greatest risk of all is from other lions. Roses on edge. has appeared alarmingly close to the cubs. It's not one Nathan recognizes. Rose is not taking any chances. Female's keeping her distance. I think she got her lesson from the mother, having a brief fight and lots of growling. It wasn't a vicious attack by lion standards, suggesting this female is from Rose's own pride, the MKs. If she was a, a female from another pride, I think she would be really aggressive and see her off completely. Most lionesses would have introduced their cubs to the rest of the pride by now. But Rose is a cautious mother and hasn't taken that step yet. She may not be ready, but Spotty, her pluckiest cub, is. I think these cubs are very curious, this other female, who she is, why they're not allowed to go and see her. 
I'm sure the Cubs are very bored of each other and their own mothers, and the chance to play with someone else would be just so, so tempting. This might be the first introduction to another lion. So this is a bit of a new experience, you know, who is this other person? Can we play with them? The cubs seem fascinated with their new playmate. This female from their pride isn't a threat. She may well be their aunt. But Rose is still anxious. With the recent invasion of the nomad males in the valley, the cubs might be better off under the protection of the pride. But for now, Rose is still choosing to keep them hidden. Free from their mother's care, the five musketeers must now make an impression on their world. Being independent, they are finally ready to live up to their old mother's legacy. Hunting giraffe. Further down the bank, two musketeers get into position. Gunner wanders into new territory. It's the home range of a large troop of Chakma baboons. The Savuti coalition is preyed on this colony, and the sight of Gunner puts the baboons on high alert. An alarm bark signals the male baboons to move in on the cheetah's position. Gunner is too thirsty to care, but he should. This male has four-inch canines and powerful jaws. Gunner's never faced a single baboon in a fight. Now he's attracted a small army of them. 
Baboons will form mobs against enemies like cheetahs and leopards. And while Gunner drinks, he's being surrounded. Gunner senses that it's time to move away from the waterhole. The menace and hostility of the baboons is growing by the second. But the cheetah's retreat only makes the defenders more confident and more aggressive. The troop is taking no chances with the cheetah. It's not about turf. It's about security and the safety of their young. Gunner decides to take a stand, but his show of force backfires. One lesson he remembers from his mother. Where there's a bird, there's an egg. The ground is strewn with the remains of several plundered eggshells. Not much left here for a hungry honey badger. But grits in luck. There's one left. All he has to do is break open the shell. Easier said than done. Ostrich eggs are the largest on Earth, weighing up to three pounds, and the strongest, and really slippery. Not so easy to crack, even for a honey badger. He takes every chance to knock the egg into rocks and stumps, hoping to start a crack. Looks like he's making progress. Finally. In the wild, animals create pathways through the bush known as game trails. For creatures like tiny rodents to the world's largest land mammals, these trails provide easier movement and often lead to water holes or good feeding grounds. And it's along paths like these that puff adders will position themselves to wait for prey. But when unsuspecting victims, weighing thousands of pounds, tread too close for comfort, a little 13-pounder puff adder can defend itself in a mighty way. It doesn't seem possible that a bite from a tiny snake could pierce the skin of a rhino, let alone do any serious damage. But here's evidence to the contrary. A bite caused such severe necrosis on the leg of this black rhino that her entire foot rotted off, leaving behind just bone fragments and flaps of decaying flesh. Trauma like this would render most animals immobile, ensuring a slow and painful death due to starvation and septicemia. It's an extreme example of what happens when a puff adder bite is left untreated. Honey badgers don't see very well, but they have a powerful sense of smell, many times more powerful than our own. 
Grit's just gotten a whiff of something tasty. This tiny rodent is the Namaqua rock rat. He's a master at hide and seek. When you're on everybody's menu, you need a clever plan, one that'll keep predators at bay. The sweet thorn tree is common throughout Namibia. Its sharp spikes provide a fortress, an impenetrable barrier of two-inch thorns. If Grit wants lunch, he'll have to figure out how to break in. His body is encased in a thick, rubbery hide, which gets him past the first few branches, but he's enduring painful jabs. This is the classic honey badger hunting technique. Pin prey with the claws and then go for the bite. But he's getting hung up on the thorns. The rock rat's plan is working. He's just staying clear. But Grit pulls through and he toughs out the thorns. The rat stares death in the face, but still has enough grit himself to sink his teeth into Grit's tongue. The leopard has just started hunting on its own. And the baby monkeys are too busy playing to spot him. Leopard strikes, but misses. The young monkey is quick, but not quick enough. The adult monkeys are in shock. They're now fully awake and angry. This leopard clearly has a lot to learn. It doesn't finish the kill. Bigger, stronger prey would have escaped. But this is the training ground of the wild. It can seem cruel. The monkeys, too, have learned an important lesson. It pays to be vigilant. One of the young mothers has spotted a lone oryx in the dunes. This is the ultimate hunt for a desert-adapted lion.
she stalks through the motionless waves of this sea of sand. The dunes become her ally, the sand her disguise. Today, the desert hunts with her. The majority of hunts end in failure. But not today. The rest of her pride is unaware of the kill. But her successful hunt doesn't go unnoticed. With scavengers on the scene, she can't risk leaving the kill to fetch the rest of her pride. Her maternal instinct kicks in. She calls out for the others. Her roar is an invitation. After a mile or two, an impala in a network of gullies. The impala never saw her coming. At last, she has finally made a kill but her cubs are on the other side of the river, and she is raiding someone else's hunting ground. She's being watched by two territorial males who won't hesitate to kill intruders. The mother lioness has been caught red-handed. The males who own this western side of the Luangwa have found her stealing a meal. Lucky to escape with only a beating. The males follow her to the river. She has no choice. She has to swim. Croc very nearly got her. The two males could cross the river after her, but they've made their point. This is the serval. The serval is a medium-sized cat. It weighs about 30 pounds on average, but it's fast. It can hit 45 miles an hour on the open run, making it the second fastest cat after the cheetah. If you compare the serval's proportions to those of other large cats, it looks almost misshapen. Its legs, relative to the rest of its body, are the longest of any cat. This, along with its strangely long neck, gives it the nickname giraffe cat. If we had ears the same proportion to our head as servals do, they'd be the size of dinner plates. Because it's not that big, the serval tends to go after smaller prey, like rodents, birds, reptiles, and even insects. This solitary hunter can actually use echolocation to locate its prey hidden in the grasses. This cat's caught the sound of something, a helmeted guinea fowl. The guinea fowl has realized it's in the crosshairs and flees. When the 
as Serval runs, it moves vertically as well as horizontally, so it can keep an eye on its target. Despite these blistering bursts of speed, the Serval's long legs are primarily an adaptation for pouncing, not running. Muscles transmit forces via tendons in the elongated toe bones that behave mechanically like springs. The tendons act as power amplifiers, storing the energy of the muscular work, then releasing it quickly to power the serval off the ground. As it closes in, the guinea fowl reveals its ace in the hole, a powerful leap into space. It may not know that a serval's secret weapon is a 10-foot vertical leap. Baby mambas are notoriously nervous and highly aggressive. But at this vulnerable age, they are still easy prey for mongoose, honey badgers, and predatory birds, all of which have immunity to a dose of snake venom. Over the coming months, the hatchlings will grow constantly and rapidly, and by a year, the females will be ready to mate and the males will be fighting for breeding rights. For now, their pin-sharp focus is finely tuned on their first mission, predation. Mambas prefer warm-blooded prey like small mammals and birds. necessary in order to immobilize each specific kill. Sometimes bypassing venom altogether if the prey is small and helpless. Just days after birth, the baby mambas have already proven themselves as adept hunters, capable of fending for themselves and taking their rightful place in Mamba Valley. ambushed just before sunrise. This kudu bull couldn't see them coming. It's a meal big enough to feed the pride for a week. But lions this size want more. And it's in their nature to exploit every opportunity. It's less than an hour since breakfast. But a principal pride female spots an opportunity one she can't resist. There's no way to stay hidden. 
so she's trying out new tactics. As water evaporates and levels drop, animals must dip their heads into the trenches to reach it, blocking their view. She waits for the perfect moment when the big male kudu's eyes drop below the banks. The kudu's relying only on hearing now. delivers death quickly. She's banked another meal for her pride. No small feat for a single lioness. 